Hey, what's going on, role players? It's the Bard here, and welcome back to the corner. So, I found myself asking the inevitable question Are our player characters getting too powerful? I'm not talking about the way in which we build our characters, but instead, I'm talking about the options that are presented to us to build our characters from. Well, the short answer is yes. But the long answer is yes, but it's all relative. So, what prompted this discussion? Well, as per usual, I was looking through the various character options, wondering if I could make something that was a little bit unusual. And as is par for the course, I decided to have a look at some of my old media and see if there was anything there that took my interest. So this is supposed to be more of a thought-provoking discussion video, but I'll still show you the process that led me to it. So I decided to dust off the old PS2. Yes, 2. Incidentally, it still works. And I decided to put out this little gem, Star Ocean 3. Very noise, as the kids are saying. And all these things led me to this character on your screen now, Albel Knox, or Albel the Wicked. This is a character that just ticks all the boxes for me. Interesting character design, fun to control, well-written backstory, strong personality. These are the qualities that I think really make a good character, but that's a discussion for another time. So I'll try and keep this fairly brief, because it's not about the character I was building, it's about the numbers that were appearing. So there are other things that I was looking at taking, such as Warcaster, Green Flame Blade, Shocking Grass, but they're not really important right now. It's the things that are on screen at the moment which had my attention. So I went with Hunter Ranger. I decided to go Dual Wielder for more interesting weapon options and potentially more higher damage output. I wanted to have a look at the Colossus Slayer because the Hunter Tree seemed like one that was going to fit the character better. The Favoured Foe is something I swapped out because I didn't really care for Favoured Enemy. It felt like it didn't suit the character. Then I started to look at the Warlock abilities and I wanted to go with Improved Pact Weapon because I fancied going Blade Lock. Genie's Vessel seemed to add a bit of extra damage to my main attacks and Eldritch Smite was something I could use to again get more physical damage on the weapons because I didn't want it to be a spell casting character but some of the options that these classes provide give you bonuses onto your attack rather than having to use spells all the time. So what happened during the process is that I looked at these abilities that I thought suited the character best but as I began to look through the various abilities that I'd chosen and started totaling up the numbers it began to feel like I was lazily overstacking damage dice. But the problem was, is that was not the case. So one swing from this character could potentially do 68 plus 1d6 plus their strength bonus plus 5. Now that's an enormous amount of damage, but it's a little bit misleading. Because A, it requires resources, and B, there are certain abilities that only happen on your first swing and can only be used once per turn. So let's strip this back a little bit and have a look at what our basic attacks are doing. Two attacks with the packed weapon to get the plus one bonus, as well as the strength modifier and the damage dice. And the offhand attack is going to be a normal weapon with just the strength modifier, because we'll be using the two weapon fighting feature. These are all perfectly normal numbers, and they're absolutely what you would expect to get from a character which has a two weapon fighting style. Many of my concerns however started to arise when I was looking at some of the abilities however that the classes were providing. A lot of commenters have said that there's imbalances because many of the classes are front loaded with powerful abilities. So the first thing you'll probably notice is that these abilities or many of them are only usable once per round and they typically happen on the first time you strike a creature. Colossus Slayer for example always happens on the first attack providing, of course, you meet the condition that it already be damaged beforehand. Favoured Foe works in a similar way, except you can choose when to mark it because you only have so many uses of it. Genie's Wrath, however, is something you can use whenever you feel like it, but you can still only use it once per round. Some of these abilities are also limited on how many times you can use it. For example, your Eldritch Smite is limited by how many spell slots you have available in your Warlock class. This is typically two at this level. However, these things refresh every short rest, not long rest. Also, your favoured foe can only be used as many times as you have proficiency modifier, which is four in this case, and that only refreshes every long rest. Whilst these are limiting factors, it all comes down to just how often your party rests between battles and how many battles you have per day. 
characters out in the wilderness could realistically expect to have maybe one or two battles, but a character in a dungeon may find themselves having half a dozen or maybe more, considering just how many potential individual encounters you may find within a dungeon complex. As it stands, when it comes to smaller encounters, you're probably not going to use half of these abilities anyway. Your limited ones you probably want to keep for something bigger. If you're fighting a group of goblins or orcs, you may only get to use Genie's Vessel. If they are a little bit more tankier creatures, you might get a proc of Colossus Slayer. But chances are, at this level, you're probably fighting creatures that are more challenge appropriate. A pack of Fomorians, for example, could still be a good challenge for a tier 3 party. Considering their challenge rating 8, they have the potential to deal a lot of damage to a group that is unprepared. So just in case anyone doesn't know, the challenge rating of a creature is supposed to suggest a decent challenge for a group of 4 characters of that same level. The characters I typically present are usually somewhere within the region of level 12, that way the levels are obtainable, but also it gives you plenty of room for growth afterwards. But even for a group of 12th level adventurers, 3-6 to six Fomorians is quite the challenge. These are creatures that have somewhere in the region of 149 HP on average. They're also entitled to 2 attacks per round, that can be 2 Great Club attacks, or 1 Great Club and 1 Evil Eye attack. So 2 normal attacks from this creature is doing almost exactly the same damage as our character who's using Colossus Slayer, Favored Foe, Eldritch Smite, and Genie's Wrath. Now our character could easily run out of Eldritch Smite, with only two available per short rest, as well as the fact that Favored Foe requires concentration, so there's the very real chance of being able to lose that extra damage as well. The philosophy in D&D is that this is a giant type creature and therefore it will typically have a low armor class but a large HP pool so that you will be doing lots of attacks to it but it will still be a resilient creature. There are other things that are also very difficult to factor in such as wizard crowd control or cleric healing or rogue sneak attack from hiding. There are other story based factors that might come into play as well. Is this an encounter that the party has from fresh? Or have they had a few encounters in the day and their HP pools and their spell slots are partially depleted? Therefore, in many cases, in order to stay relevant, in order to keep up with the monsters as they are progressing in difficulty, the players do need some kind of special effects which are adding bonuses to their characters. Furthermore, I can't tell you a character's access to magical equipment. They might have no magical gear at this point in the game if you're running a completely low fantasy campaign. On the other hand, you may have huge amounts of equipment with massive plus three armors, shields and swords all available at the drop of a hat. It's all dependent. Finally, there's one more thing that I think needs to be addressed. If you look back at old editions of the game and compare them with the new, you'll see that creatures have really progressed in their ability to soak and deal damage. Whilst this certainly is not the case for every creature, some of which are not the challenge that they used to be, a lot of creatures have actually had a big boost to their capabilities over time. So let's have a look at a few lower level creatures and see how they've power crept over the years. So I'm taking these numbers from D&D Basic, 3rd edition and 5th edition. Now D&D Basic came out long before I was even playing this game. This book I have is older than I am. Now there are other factors at play such as armor class, special abilities, resistances and various other things including saving throws and proficiencies. But just to keep it simple, we're going to go with hit points and damage, just as a basic outline. So back during D&D Basic, the creature had 1 HD which was 1d8 and it had 1 damage dice which was 1d6. When it moved to 3rd, it still kept the 1 hit dice but it was improved to a d12. The damage also increased by one point, or it can make two attacks with less damage dice, but it still had the bonus from its strength. Nowadays in 5th edition, skeletons have two hit dice, plus four on top of that, as well as the fact that their damage has also increased to 1d6 plus two. Another thing to also note is that in 5th edition, skeletons have access to short bows, meaning they can deal the same damage but at a distance. This makes them much more tactically adept than they were before. 
Yes, the DM has license to give them whatever abilities and equipment they think are necessary, but understand that this is the baseline for this creature. So in the beginning, this creature had an average of 4 or 5 hit points and could do roughly 3 to 4 damage. Nowadays, it's got an average HP pool of 13, and it can deal an average of 5 to 6 damage, but at range, before closing in on its target. Orcs are another interesting example. Between D&D Basic and 3rd Edition, their damage has nearly doubled. Between 3rd Edition and 5th Edition, their HP pools have tripled. In D&D Basic, they only had access to melee attacks, but from 3rd Edition onwards, they were given javelins, so again, they have a ranged option. There are also other little factors to consider, such as in 3rd Edition, they had small penalties on their attack rolls in Bright Light. When it comes to their abilities in 5th, they can now cover a 60 foot distance if they need to in order to get into melee combat with an enemy party. Hobgoblins are up next. They haven't really changed very much between basic and third, but between third and fifth, you'll notice that whilst the damage appears the same, they have the martial advantage ability, which gives them an additional 2d6 when they're next to one of their allies. Two hobgoblins together, therefore, will both get that additional 2d6 on top of their damage. They've also got quite a significant increase to their armor class as well, going from 15 in 3rd to 18 in 5th edition. Let's end this video by looking at the Medusa. This is a great creature, but before you ask, I like the one with the snake tails. I don't like my Medusas on legs. The Medusa is a little bit more difficult to analyze in this way because of the way poison and petrification work over the different editions, but the premise is still more or less the same. Its HP pool is roughly 18 for an average roll in D&D Basic. In 3rd edition, the average is 33. But when you get to 5th edition, its hit point average is 127. So the creature's HP has nearly doubled from Basic to 3rd, and it's nearly quadrupled from 3rd to 5th. The creature's damage values haven't changed much between Basic and 3rd, However, in basic, it makes one attack. In third edition, it can make two attacks, one with the dagger, one with its snake hair. In fifth edition, however, its damage has absolutely shot up. 1d8 plus 2 plus 2d6 for its poisoned arrows, and it can make two of these bow attacks per round. Or it can make two short sword attacks at 1d6 plus 2, plus one snake hair attack at 1d4 plus 2, but with a 4d6 poison damage effect. A 5th edition Medusa that hits with all of its attacks in melee deals on average 28 points of damage. That's four times what it was doing in 3rd. And the craziest part is, this creature has actually had its challenge rating reduced from 7 to 6. So in relative terms, a creature that's dealing four times as much damage as it was, and has four times as much HP as it did, is not considered as much of a challenge as it was two editions ago. Please understand, however, that these are not definitives. Trying to compare different editions of the game is like trying to compare apples with oranges. It just can't be done properly. The purpose of these creature examples is to show you how the numbers have progressed over the years. Therefore, the point that I'm trying to illustrate by showing you these different creature variants is that there are creatures whose HP totals and damage totals are doubling, tripling, or even quadrupling in some cases. And as such, the players need to be able to keep up with that amount of damage and that amount of hit points they have to cut through. So these abilities that they're getting, some of which are only usable a few times per day, yes, it's creeping a little bit, but much of it is relevant to what they're going to be facing as you progress through the various levels of your character. Compared to the rules in the player's handbook, the options in Xanathar's Guide to Everything may be a little bit weaker in places, and the options in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything might be a little bit stronger in places. But overall, you're not going to see huge varying swathes of difference between characters. So, have the player character's abilities power crept? Well, over the different editions, yes, they certainly have. Have character options crept up between the various expansions to the game? A little bit, but maybe not as much as some people think they have. Once again, in certain areas, there are things you just cannot compare fairly because of the way the mechanics work, especially between editions. So I urge you to have a look at these things yourself and come to your own conclusions. 
Are these power creeps necessary for the characters, considering just how much stronger monsters are in the current edition of play? That's for you to decide. Still, more options are better than no options. And whatever makes the characters more fun and more interesting and more engaging, they're usually going to be a good thing. Either way, hopefully you enjoyed this discussion on the power and progression of the player character options. Again, I urge you to look at the numbers yourself and come up with your own conclusions. I'd really like to hear about them in the comments section down below. Do you think that the creatures are getting too powerful or are they a little bit too frail? Are the characters being able to cut down the monsters with ease or do you think they need a little boost here and there? Whatever your opinion, I would like to know. If you like this video, please leave a like. If you're new to the channel, why not consider subscribing? I've got a great community here. And also remember to hit that notification bell so that you can be informed every time something pops up from the channel. And with all that being said, I will see you guys next time at the gaming table. <laughs>